Folks, it's nice to be with you today and be able to share in your service. I appreciate the, the folks doing the music here. It's nice to have them. And it's really lovely to have a nice, uh, a nice uh, a, a bit of worship to lead us um, as we meet uh, together in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. So let's have a little word of prayer before we read God's word. So let's just pray. Bless you, Lord, for being able to be here today and for uh, the effort that uh, we've co- uh, gone to to be here. Some of us may be traveling a treacherous road. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here safely. We pray, Lord, that as we would read your word, as we'd think about it, that you would come and bless us and, and speak to us, we pray, and help us to understand what your word says to us today. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you have in your Bibles there, uh, Matthew chapter 1, and uh, what page is it? It would be 967. Matthew chapter 1. It should look like that there. Okay? Blank page and then Matthew. So Matthew chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 1. And it says, A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abram. Abram was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nahalon, Nashlon, sorry, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, who was mother of Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon whose mother had been Uriah's wife, Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of uh, Jehor, Jehor, Jehoram, Je- uh, and then Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, Abiud the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Eliud, Eliud, the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Matham, Matham, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, and the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. These were the 14 generations in all, from Abram to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the, uh, from the exile to the Christ. And there we end our reading. Now, some years ago, I was asked to take part in a school's carol service. And before the school's uh, the carol service commenced, a rather flummoxed teacher arrived in seeking help from whoever she could that looked intelligent at the front of the church uh, uh, and basically anyone who was willing to listen to her plight. She was not able to pronounce many of the names in Matthew chapter 1, to 17 as we've just seen and that was the panic and she was going around uh, how do you pronounce that word there how do you pronounce and she was all in such a flummox over the whole thing and um, so basically uh, basically she had been invited by the clergy person who was in charge of the service to read the particular passage and the clergy person then uh, had organized the readings but he then became aware of the teacher's plight and how uh, how she was struggling to to understand these names and then a little bit more of an inquisition happened and it turned out and instead of it being Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 to 25 it was meant to be Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 to 25 so they were going to skip those first 17 verses as is normally the case and what a relief to the poor teacher that she didn't have to read those first 17 verses she was somewhat relieved because after that point in verse 18, the reading becomes rather straightforward. 
And that was the situation. But why do we suddenly jump, suddenly jump to verse 18 uh, when we're reading of the birth of the Savior? Because it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses seven, uh, 16 to 17, it says, All scripture is, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, for uh, in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And if we believe that, then under God, there must be something to learn from these first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 1, which will benefit our work with God and our understanding of the Savior. We don't need to skip them. There's something there for us. Now, to be honest, I'm only doing a hop, skip and jump over it uh, because you could spend weeks going through this if you were prepared for that. And you'd nearly be well into Easter before you'd get through it. But we're having a little hop, skip and a jump through it all. And there are a few things that I want to take from it. First of all, we learn is a pattern for society is there in this passage. Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 to 2. It says, that, uh, it says there the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abram. Abram was the father of Isaac. Isaac the father of Jacob. And Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And to start off. Our passage is a reminder from the heart of God of the structures which God has placed within society. Um, he has given us order, and for that to work, there are rules. And I've been going through this with the children in our clubs. Um, I've been sort of basing a lot of the narrative on a book uh, called, or a, a crowd called Good Seed, who wrote a book called The Stranger on the Road to Emmaus. And basically, uh, as John Cross was presenting the, the gospel message, um, he presents the whole idea of creation and the whole idea of creation and, and, and six days of creation, day of rest and, and, and order and reason and logic and all those things which we so easily take for granted but they're there for a purpose and God has put structure and order within the world in which we live because there needs to be rules. There needs to be rules for every facet of society and even within families. There are rules. Leviticus chapter 18 uh, highlights some of the people that God does not want us to marry simply because they're close relatives. Um, and genealogy had a lot of traditional importance in Jewish society. And originally the knowledge of tribal origins was used to assign people a, a place in the marching order of, uh, of, of Israel throughout the, through the wilderness. And later it was used to uh, to assign the allotment of lands in Canaan and also to determine property rights and ownership. So who you were was very important and structures and who you were connected to, all that was very important. And then there was the business of marriage, inheritance, loans. These were all affected in some way by the ability to prove who you were related to. And hopefully we are still in a stage where we know who were who our parents were and who our grandparents were and so on and there's all these websites where you can go and research all this there and send in a bit of dna and they'll tell you that you might be related to some important person or you might be just related to nobody but you never know um, but anyway genealogy is important and god put that there and we see it here in this because it is important and even in the story of ruth we see the necessity of someone um, uh, trying to retain the family name. And whenever Elimelech died, and Malin and Killian also passed away, there was a, a serious danger that the inheritance or, and the family name would be lost. And, and so genealogy was important. And our society today, th there is the danger of losing the structure that was once clear. And the clearly documented institution of marriage is slipping away only to be replaced by casual relationships where there's a lack of information concerning one person's relationship to another and who a person is and where they came from and all these other things. And with so many other liberal ideas coming into our, our country that are being embraced by a lot of liberal people and they will present a lot of other problems going down the tracks. That, that, that God never intended to be so. And there are warnings right throughout the Bible of all those other issues, even in the Old Testament, that they didn't work then and they won't work today. And we should take note. And so as we celebrate the Christmas season and the coming of the only Saviour, 
we are being reminded here of the importance of family structures as we see there in Matthew chapter 1. These are something that we should cherish at the Christmas season. Love it or loathe it. You know, this, the whole Abinar phrase that I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to be speaking on very soon, it's called the word perfect. You know, do you, do you ever hear it in advertisements? Perfect family Christmas, perfect present. And like our family at home is not perfect, right? Uh, and, and so, so whatever way your family looks, you just kind of have to run with it. And don't get into bondage about things being perfect. Because even for, for Mary and Joseph uh, and Jesus being born, uh, you would love to have been a fly in the wall because there were so many issues and so many things that didn't work out well for them. Imagine that, like a shepherd coming, like um, sort of knocking on the door that uh, we've been told to come here. And was Mary and Joseph expecting a few shepherds to land at an awkward time in their their kind of personal lives? Not really. So listen, it wasn't perfect then, so don't get bogged down about perfect Christmas and families. Sometimes you have to work with what there, what there is. But anyway, um, these are, this, the whole family thing, the genealogies, all, all these things are what God says that we should treasure and, and, and embrace whatever way that looks. And uh, whether it's uh, our background or family history, whatever warts there are in the middle of that, that's where we are. Our own family history is not our fault. It's our legacy. It's, it's, uh, it's upon what we can place the, the grace of God which brings deliverance into our situation. And we need to remember that. Whatever happened before us was nothing to do with us. And, but we just have to sort of work with it and run with it. Like I've got a family. My father's side is a, a whole, whole list of problems. Uh, and basically, somewhere in my father's um, in my in my father's generation, they changed the name because I'm T O M B, uh, pronounced Tom, and that's the way it's meant to be pronounced. But my uncles, whom I never really got to know because I was discouraged to know, pronounce it T H O M and spell it T H O M, and went to the extent of even changing a grave st- a grave headstone to pronounce so it was spelled T H O M. Anyway, there you go. So we all have our warts, whatever they are. Um, And surely the characters in Christ's lineage, as we see here, are also reminders of the people who God can use uh, and and the change which can be wrought in a life. And it says in Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 1, it says, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, and, and you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, And the quarry from which you were dug. And that's basically uh, God saying, uh, God saying, look back at wherever you came from and and build upon that, be thankful for it, and move on from it. And then the the psalmist David, he said in Psalm 40, he drew me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So whatever David was going through, uh, David knew the deliverance and help of God in whatever he was facing at that time and how God helped him uh, and and, and totally changed his life. And so we see it there. We see a pattern for society. Where we've come from, that's what we have. We work with it and the grace of God can be uh, brought into that. We see not only a pattern for society, we see also a proof of heritage. And the Gospel of Matthew was written about uh, 60 AD approximately, 30 years after the death of Jesus. And at that time, Matthew still had access to the official authorized genealogies of of Jesus, Joseph, Mary, and King David. Um, So when it was written, if anyone doubted what Matthew was speaking about and about this genealogy of Jesus, they would simply go into the temple of Jerusalem and check it out for themselves. They were able to do that. Now, we can't do that, and we have to base what we know on what Matthew wrote and all their historical books as well. But Matthew is writing in his gospel primarily to the Jewish nation, and he really wants, uh, wants to show that Jesus is the Messiah that they've all been waiting for, So he starts by addressing the biggest objection of all, that some say Jesus is not the son of Joseph. And he does it by examining the genealogy of Jesus. And in verse 16, instead of 
saying Joseph was the father of Jesus. It says Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. And Matthew, he takes this potential problem uh, that Jesus isn't Joseph's son uh, and thus not necessarily a descendant of Abram uh, and David to show that Jesus and only Jesus is the Messiah. And Matthew presents uh, here not a direct bloodline from Abram to, uh, to David and Jesus, but a legal or royal genealogy where the legal or royal rights are passed on by legal adoption as well as birthright. And that's what we need to remember. They're passed on by legal adoption as well as birthright. Jesus can claim kingship because of his descent from King David through his legal father, Joseph. And he can also prove his Jewishness without question by tracing a direct line to Abram. And Matthew also hangs out the dirty washing hidden in the ancestry of David, the, uh, 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 who was the prophet, priest, and king, whom they all re revere, and shows us that, that the, the bloodline of King David was not quite, uh, was not quite as pure as they would uh, like to think. Uh, and we all have, the, the, as it were, the, the, the dirty washing in our ancestors. I, I recently heard of a large family dynasty who had recently become aware that a, the now deceased matriarch um, had a daughter before she was ever married. And this had only come to light in recent times and was a massive revelation to the entire family dynasty. It was just something that they hadn't... Um, allowed for or counted on at all but that matriarch had carried that that whole burden for for years until her until her uh, until her death and yet it came to light in, in more recent times so we all have these things that are hidden in our cupboards their skeletons that that come out from time to time so we see not only a proof of heritage there with with jesus and, and that jesus was uh, legally there by uh, by legal adoption not only do we not only do we see we see that as well. Um, uh, we see also a presentation of grace. Matthew presents a roll call of notable characters, many of whom had their own failures: the cheaters, liars, adulterers, uh, and they all came from or they came from disadvantaged backgrounds. And in verse three, there it says, "Judah, the father of Perez." And, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. Now Tamar's, Tamar's family, a family line would have died with her. Uh, and you can look at that up in Genesis chapter 38. She wasn't just a widow, but her father-in-law uh, Judah refused to let her marry her brother-in-law, as was her legal right at the time. However, in a dramatic twist, Tamar pretended to be a prostitute, tricks Judah into sleeping with her and gives birth to two sons. And these sons become part of Judah's family tree, but only by legal adoption because Judah never married Tamar. So there you see, you see the legal adoption happening even way back then. And we read there also in Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 to 6, Salmon, the father of Boaz, by, uh, by, Rahab, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king, and David was the, the, uh, the, the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. So likewise, Rahab, the Canaanite, Ruth, the Moabite, and, and Bathsheba, the, uh, the, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, were all women who, because of their nationalities, had to convert to Judaism before marrying their Jewish husbands. And for some of these ladies, God came to them in a broken place in their lives, redeemed them, and gave them a new start. And, and we see here a presentation of grace. Uh, of grace. And many on their own, or the roll call were not, uh, were not by descent blood relatives, they were legally adopted and accepted into the lineage of Christ. And here God's love was lavished on those who least deserved it. And it says there in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9, For by, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Matthew Henry, he says, We ought, to up, uh, uh, we ought not to upbraid people with the scandals of their ancestors. It is what they cannot help and, and has been the lot of the best even of our master himself. 
And so we, we celebrate the coming of a Savior into this world because he was one of us, because he knows our pain, and we can then have confidence that he can rescue us from whatever pit we find ourselves in. And there's a song, it says, from the squalor of a borrowed stable by the spirit and a virgin's birth to the anguish and the shame of scandal came the saviour of the human race. But the skies were filled with the praise of heaven. Shepherds listen as the angels tell of the gift of God come down to man at the dawning of Emmanuel. King of heaven now, the friend of sinners, humble servant in the Father's hands, filled with power and the Holy Spirit, filled with mercy for the broken man. Yes, he walked my road and he felt my pain, joys and sorrows that I know so well. Yet his righteous steps give me hope again. I will follow my Emmanuel. And that's so true. Uh, and so Jesus identifies with much of what we are facing, much of what we're going through, much of our brokenness, much of our warts, all those things that we face and we feel, oh, this is only, this is only a problem that I have and no one else faces these things. Jesus identifies with, with you. We see also uh, not only a presentation of grace, we see also a preservation despite all odds. And dotted throughout the passage that we see there, we see, uh, we see the reality that on many occasions that the Israelites faced hardship and affliction uh, in Egypt, losing their home, homeland to exile in Babylon, and losing many of their number at various times, and it dwindled down, and then they, they picked up, uh, and through it all, God, God wo uh, wove a, 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 a promise that he would keep uh, the lineage going right through to, to Jesus being uh, Jesus being born. And the genealogy is testament to how God kept his promise and was never without a faithful witness. We see also a promise fulfilled. There are up to 300 prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament. Uh, and to be the Messiah, Jesus, uh, he would have to be a number of things. And I, I outlined some of them here that we see even in this passage. An Israelite, a son of Abram, he was that. From the line of Jesse, Isaiah chapter one and or chapter eleven and verse one says, "There shall come forth a, a shoot from the stump of Jesse; a branch from his roots shall be, uh, shall bear fruit." Of the line of David, he was that. Of the tribe of Judah and born in Bethlehem, Micah chapter five verse two says, "But you Bethlehem Ephrathah." Uh, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, yet from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. He was to be born to a virgin. Uh, also, we, uh, we read that the Messiah would spend some time in Egypt. And we read that in Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. When Israel was a child, I, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. He, this is now a notable one, and we see it here in this uh, passage as well. He must not be a blood relative of King Je uh, Jeconiah. And it says in Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 30, Thus says the Lord, Write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in, uh, in Judah. And you'll read there in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 11, And Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. So Jeconiah is mentioned there. Uh, and, uh, and again, that was the, uh, if Jesus had been born uh, uh, from that lineage, there would have been a problem because Jeconiah was so evil that God cursed him and his entire bloodline. And if Jesus had been born of that uh, bloodline or, or a physical son of Joseph, he would have been cursed by this curse on Jeconiah and could never have been the Messiah. However, when Joseph married Mary, Jesus joined the legal or royal line from, uh, from King David by adoption, legal adoption, as Joseph's legal heir. So Jesus bypasses the curse of Jeconiah, fulfilling the prophecies about the Messiah of the, full, uh, uh, of the line of David, but not a blood relative of Jeconiah. And these are things that you'll only get from that little bit of a passage. And so, you know, as we, as we bring things to a conclusion, when someone comes to, to an area, we're all too quick to find out who they're related to. Now, I'll give you a good example of this. Our young fellow, Nathan, 
has gone the way of all flesh. He has got himself a girlfriend. Okay, now that's a warning to you folks. If your if you're young people are at the stage of my young people, it's kind of inevitable that this sort of thing happens. So, what happened was, as I was informed, he was up at one point meeting the parents, as you do. So then, basically, he went up, um, and apparently, the way it all all unfolded was that he was friendly with the girlfriend's brother, Horst. He stroked the cat to get the kit. So, so um, he was friendly with the girlfriend's brother, and then the whole thing then sort of side shifted sideways and got interested in the girlfriend. And the parents didn't take much notice of who or Nathan was until I think there was an interest in the girlfriend then things ramped up an awful lot and there was a full inquisition of who Nathan was so then whenever whenever they asked Nathan who he was and they realised that he was, was the son of a man namely me who went to Bible college with the girlfriend's uncle well that sorted it all out there <laughs> I'm straightforward I'm sure he's, he's grand then so and that, that was it and, and, you know, depending on who you are and who you're connected to, it just, it just sets people's minds at ease. It just eases, them. oh, sure, we know him. We know who he was and know who he was connected to. And that's why Matthew puts this passage in at the start of, of, of the gospel because it explains and sets people's minds at ease. Oh, sure, we know him. Sure, he's connected to Abram. Job done, sorted. Uh, and so at the very outset of the Gospel of Matthew, the writer is very quick to set our minds at ease. He presents Jesus and who he is and who he's related to. And so the red cord of God's grace is woven throughout the genealogy of Jesus. But the question remains, like the early Jewish readers, uh, what will we do with Jesus? One thing having the information, not a thing doing something with it. Will we believe all that is written about him and give our life to him or will we doubt the very authority of scripture and continue to have no firm anchor in our life? Will we understand that he came to be the saviour of the world to set people free from their guilt and their failures or will we continue to struggle being pounded by Satan and his accusations because Jesus can set people free? And this Christmas season, I invite you to put your trust in the one who came to this earth to die for all our sins and to die for all our problems and our warts and all our failures and all that we've been born into. Jesus came to set people free. And we're reminded of what it says in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For, us, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, uh, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's just have a little prayer. Bless you, Lord, for where we find ourselves this morning, looking at this genealogy, and we're conscious that we've only dipped into it, but we thank you, Lord, that Jesus came from this lineage, yeah, and by legal adoption, and you brought him into it, and you sidestepped all the issues, and we recognize, Lord, that we are no different and we have, we have come from a checkered history, a checkered past. And yet we thank you, Lord, that Jesus identifies with us. And by your grace, you can step into our lives. And Father, we pray that you'll make us the people that you want us to be, even at this Christmas season. Write these thoughts upon our hearts uh, this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.